welcome everybody. Um, I was about to say good morning, but looking at the uh, list of attendees I, and panelists, I see people are in uh, many different time zones. So I will just leave this as a generic greetings. Um, this is the latest uh, in the Center for Nonproliferation Studies uh, webinar series on nuclear threats in the war in Ukraine. Uh, but for this session, we are broadening the aperture a little bit uh, to move away from nuclear weapons to two of the other weapons categories that are often uh, included in the uh, umbrella term WMD, weapons of mass destruction. Uh, so this is a panel on implications for the use and proliferation of chemical and biological weapons uh, raised by the Russian invasion of uh, Ukraine. Uh, my name is Jeff Knopf. I'll be uh, moderating the panel. Uh, I'm a professor at the Middlebury Institute of International Studies at Monterey. Uh, and I have the pleasure to serve as the chair of our master's degree program in nonproliferation and terrorism studies. Um, we have a great uh, panel today. I'm going to introduce all three speakers in the order in which they'll be speaking. That way I can just turn the floor over to them uh, to speak. Uh, so first up will be uh, Dr. Uh, Philippa Lentzos. Uh, she's a senior lecturer in science and international security at King's College London, where she focuses on biological threats, health security, bio-risk management and biological arms control. Uh, she has a cross appointment to the Department of War Studies and the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine. Uh, and she's the co-director of King's Center for Science and Security Studies. Uh, she's also a non-resident scholar with us uh, in Monterey at the James Martin Center for Nonproliferation Studies, uh, as well as an associate senior researcher at CIPRI. Uh, she's the author of a couple of recent books Biological Threats in the 21st Century, uh, published by Imperial College Press, uh, and Health Security Intelligence, published by Rutledge. Uh, the second speaker will be Dr. Philip Blake, uh, one of my faculty colleagues here. He's an associate professor of nonproliferation and terrorism studies, uh, and also serves uh, as a fellow with uh, CNS uh, and our Center on Terrorism, Extremism, and Counterterrorism, CTEC. He's also the coordinator of the MIS Cyber Collaborative. Um, Dr. Blake uh, previously served as a senior advisor to the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Nuclear, Chemicological, and Biological Defense Programs uh, at a very more important moment in time uh, uh, where he served as a staffer to the Syria Chemical Weapons Senior Interagency Group. Um, he has published in a bunch of uh, journals in the field, including the Nonproliferation Review, CBRNE World, Studies in Conflict and Terrorism, the H. Diplo International Security Studies Forum, National Interest Survival, uh, amongst others. Uh, our final speaker will be Dr. Hannah Nota. Uh, she's a senior research associate with the Vienna Center for Disarmament and Nonproliferation, uh, where she focuses on arms control and security issues involving Russia, the Middle East, uh, and the implications for US and European policy. Uh, she has previously been a senior political officer with the Sheikh Group, uh, an NGO that focuses on track two uh, diplomacy in the Middle East. Uh, she received her doctorate from Oxford uh, in 2018, where she studied uh, Russia-US cooperation in the Middle East. Uh, she's been a visiting researcher with the Institute of Oriental Studies of the Russian Academy of Sciences and the Carnegie Moscow Center uh, in Russia. Uh, and she has uh, published in the Nonproliferation Review, Foreign Policy, the National Interest, uh, the Washington Post, uh, War on the Rocks, uh, amongst others. Um, each of the speakers is uh, going to talk for about 10 to 12 minutes. Um, after that, we will take questions. Uh, and um, let me request that everybody please type your questions into the Q&A uh, box, which you can find hopefully at the bottom of your screen. Uh, and uh, not the chat, we'll be looking at the Q&A box for your questions. Okay, with that, I'm happy to turn the floor over to Philippa Lensos. Thank you so much, Jeff. And a uh, warm thank you to CNS for organizing this um, panel, and in particular to, to Hannah for doing a lot of the, uh, I think, conception and, and reach out uh, on this. I'm uh, really pleased to be part of the conversation, and I look forward to our discussion. And um, thank you, too, to everyone for, for joining. I see a few familiar names um, on the participant list. It's good to see you guys. Uh, here, um, I also see a few names I don't know, and I'm looking forward to hearing uh, what you've got to say on this. Please do join in the conversation and do pop comments um, in the box, as, as Jeff was uh, was saying. Um, I very much see this as, as a conversation, uh, 
Um, I, I don't have a very formal presentation planned. Um, I thought I would um, prompt our conversation and hopefully it'll be a you know cross fertilizing one between my focus on bio and 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 Hannah and Philip's focus on the more chemical side. Um, and I thought I would uh, put out three conversation starters. And the first, uh, a very brief uh, point for me really about the prospects of Russia using biological weapons in Ukraine. Um, the second and, and the point that I will spend most of my time on, I think, is on, on disinformation and uh, these battles of influence. Um, and then um, thirdly, I'll speak very briefly on, on how we conceive of biological weapons and, and possibly some of the implications of what we're seeing in Ukraine for um, that conception. So with that, I'll make a, a, a little start and that's around prospects of, of Russia using biological weapons in, in, in Ukraine. And I think the first point to make here is really that any use of biological weapons would be unprecedented. Um, there has been no use of biological weapons uh, in war. And um, there are, I think, essentially at least two very good reasons for this. The first is that there is a so strong social norm against the use of disease as a weapon. Uh, that's a pretty deep-seated norm that um, you know goes back uh, far into history, uh, ties in with the use um, uh, or, or this kind of abhorrence against the use of poisons, seeing it as a dishonorable weapon, all of these sorts of things. So there's this strong social norm against uh, biological weapons. There is also a very strong legal norm against biological weapons. So the Biological Weapons Convention, the international treaty uh, that pertains to biological weapons completely prohibits uh, this category of uh, weaponry. It's general purpose criterion um, or this focus that it has on intent ensures that the treaty remains um, comprehensive, even though the science um, moves ahead. And I know there are some differences here on the chemical side, um, but there are uh, no exceptions essentially on, on the bio side. So it's a pretty watertight treaty. It's short, <laughs> unlike the chemical weapons treaty. Um, and it leaves a lot of... Um, um, uh, there's a lot open around the how to operationalize the treaty, um, but it does have this very comprehensive um, aspect to it. But the second, and I think even more convincing reason uh, for the fact that there's been no bioweapons use really in, in war is that the military utility of biological weapons is very limited. Um, including in the sort of combat that we're witnessing in Ukraine currently. The large scale use of biological weapons is, is difficult to operationalize. There are challenges with scale up, with storage, with transport. There are challenges with uh, delivery. Uh, there are challenges with troop training in how to use and disseminate biological weapons. Um, you know, there are certainly no we know very few, uh, if any, <laughs> countries that incorporate how to use biological weapons in, you know, military training. Um, and so uh, protecting against, yes, but how would you actually use it? Uh, I think all of those logistics um, make using biological weapons very challenging. Also, the effects of biological weapons are generally delayed. So it takes a while before uh, a biological weapon kicks in and these effects can be very unpredictable. So there is no big bang. There's no, there's not that immediacy of impact, right? Um, and there's also all kinds of uncertainty caught up in their use. Now, in, if infectious agents are used and not all biological agents are infectious, but if infectious agents are used, they're then difficult to contain in space um, and in time. So uh, in space, you know, uh, biological uh, agents, infectious agents cross borders, as we know from the pandemic uh, of firsthand experience, um, 
they could rebound on your own troops. Um, and in terms of time, uh, infectious agents just keep on infecting. So in short, they're actually not very, they haven't been considered um, militarily very useful weapons. So in my view, it's unlikely that we will see biological weapons use uh, in Ukraine, primarily because uh, I don't think they're considered uh, particularly useful weapons, uh, but also because of this norm against them. And I think it's good, been good to see both NATO and, and um, G7 intelligence disclosures on the possibility of Russia using unconventional uh, weapons, chemical, biological weapons, um, because I think these disclosures raise the political stakes of an unconventional attack. So uh, heightening the political costs of severe norm violation is an important tool to maintain the integrity of the prohibitions against biological and chemical weapons. So you're supporting the legal norm, essentially, against um, biological weapons through these uh, disclosures and, 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 and raising those stakes. So that's what I wanted to kind of um, put on the table in terms of uh, prospects of Russia using biological weapons um, in Ukraine. Um, I'll now talk a little bit about disinformation and, and battles of, of influence. And the uncertainties that I spoke about around the use of biological weapons and, and their effects make them not very good biological, not very good weapons, but they do make them particularly susceptible to disinformation. And this is the real key point that I want to put on the table for our discussion. So it won't obviously have escaped anyone's notice here that Russia accuses Ukraine of working on biological weapons supported by the United States and other countries. And as we all know, there is no evidentiary basis to suggest that Ukraine's biological activities support anything other than peaceful purposes. Ukraine, um, like many other countries, carries out biological research for legitimate public health and veterinary health purposes. And Ukraine does so transparently and in full compliance with its legal obligations under the BWC. International support for biological research in Ukraine is no secret. Uh, Ukraine, along with the US and other countries providing support to biological research in Ukraine, are transparent about their activities. They annually declare their activities under the BWC's confidence building measures, these, this data exchange between um, states uh, party to the treaty, um, and they voluntarily share this information publicly. And this contrasts sharply with Russia, which appears to actively withhold its own BWC relevant research activities from public scrutiny. It does not openly share its CBM with the public, for instance. Now, Russia's allegations tie into a long history of false claims and active measures, or so-called active measures, that stretch back to the early years of the Cold War. So since, you know, back in the 1950s, even, the Soviet Union maintained, um, started and then maintained for several decades an, a campaign alleging bioweapons use by the United States. And these false allegations have involved uh, communist allies like North Korea and China, um, as well as Cuba and Eastern European states like the GDR, Poland and Czechoslovakia, as they were then known. Um, and interestingly, they have also often involved labs, which is the sort of uh, disinformation campaign we're seeing today. So one campaign in the early 1980s alleged that a lab in Lahore, the Pakistan Malaria Research Center, was not actually a University of Maryland lab researching malaria, but a CIA-funded lab to breed weaponized mosquitoes. What they called the poisoners from overseas who worked there were plotting they alleged to infect entire uh, cattle herds with viruses and then take advantage of the seasonal migration of the herds from Pakistan to Afghanistan to start an epidemic there. The story came out about 
a year after the UN General Assembly had passed a resolution establishing the UN Secur um, Secretary General's mechanism for investigating chemical and biological weapons use. And this resulted from concerns the US had raised about Soviet use of chemical weapons in Southeast Asia, particularly in Laos and Afghanistan. And by early 1982, when this uh, disinformation campaign broke, the US government was making more and more evidence about Soviet chemical weapons use in Afghanistan available to the UN and the wider public. Um, and the Soviet disinformation campaign was an effort to throw doubt on the American evidence. And the reason I'm telling you this is I, I think we're seeing similar sorts of links uh, today, and I'll come back to that very shortly. A second disinformation campaign that started shortly after the weaponized mosquito campaign and that you will all be familiar with is the story that AIDS was an American bioweapon developed in the labs at Fort Detrick. Interestingly, that conspiracy theory is still sort of floating around. I usually ask my students every year how many of them have heard about this link between AIDS and Dietrich, and about half of them usually raise their hands uh, at this point. There have also been more formal studies of this. So one study in, in 2018 found that about um, half uh, black male homosexuals believe that HIV is a man-made virus, and about two thirds endorsed at least one HIV conspiracy uh, belief. A more recent campaign is that the Pentagon is establishing as this chain of bioweapon labs on Russia's borders. And at the heart of the accusations has been the Luger lab in Georgia. That campaign ramped up following the attempted assassination of Sergei Skripal with Novichok in the UK, uh, and particularly after British counterterrorist police presented their findings and issued arrest warrants. And over a few months in the late um, 2018, you could trace the intensifying multi-channel disinformation attack that was then unfolding. And um, Russia has also been actively trying to undermine the UNSGM, uh, the UN Secretary General's mechanism again. Um, so over the last couple of years, Russia has tried to undermine the mechanism's integrity, its independence, and its impartial character, and to strip away the Secretary General's authority by transferring investigation decisions to the Security Council, uh, where Russia has a veto. So there is this link between disinformation campaigns, um, between uh, unconventional weapons, um, use, threat of use, um, and weakening international structures for investigating biological weapons use or, or, or alleged um, use. Um, and that might be worth exploring a little uh, further. It's something I'm, I'm working on uh, in my own work at, at the moment. I've not written up anything on it yet, and I, my thoughts are not fully formed. But as part of this conversation we're having, I just wanted to put it on the table in case uh, others um, have uh, some interesting input there. Um, very briefly, just to, to sort of uh, finish off these disinformation campaigns, you know, the key difference to note, I think, from the two disinformation campaigns in the 1980s um, and the, um, the, um, the Luger Lab uh, campaign uh, a few years ago, is that the practice is no longer to plant items in obscure media outlets abroad. Now, some of the most senior officials in the Russian government delivered the disinformation. So you saw that the head of the Russian National Security Council delivered it, uh, the foreign minister pushed the disinformation campaign, the spokesperson for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, et cetera. Um, and another um, difference is the speed compared to what was going on uh, in the 1980s, how much longer that took weeks and months uh, to spread. Um, and here was uh, in, in, in 2018, it was very much uh, quicker. The current disinformation campaign we're seeing uh, focused on uh, Ukraine basically says the same thing as the Luger Lab uh, campaign, that there is this ring of labs uh, around Russia that's doing nefarious things, um, working with dangerous pathogens, 
developing biological weapons, carrying out experiments on local people, all of these sorts of uh, things. Um, it's it's almost surprising how, um, what's the right word? Incredible, uncredible, how, 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 how not credible <laughs> the reports are um, the, or the evidence that's presented to back up these claims, but still they're being presented at a very high level. Um, even some of the same mouthpieces are used as were used in the Luger Lab campaign. So at a recent um, ARIA session of the UN Security Council, uh, a, spe a kind of special session of it, um, outside of the, the normal format, uh, Russia used the exact same tactics as they did back in, in 2018, uh, even bringing in the same, very same person, this um, uh, allegedly or, uh, you know, um, independent uh, Bulgarian journalist to corroborate what uh, an official, a, a government official was saying. And, and they did exactly the same thing with the same person um, back in, in 2018. And some of the informalities around these allegations are, are very striking. Um, you know, at last, <laughs> just, uh, at last week's um, press briefing by the deputy perm rep to the UN, uh, you hear a lot of this, these kinds of allegations. And at the end, he signs off with a, stay tuned, we'll keep you posted on these kinds of allegations. And so there is, there, there is something very jarring in terms of the allegations that are made and then the way in which these allegations are made outside of the formal structures that we have in place in which to raise these allegations, but also in the manners um, in which um, they are they are brought up. Um, we can also see some very brief, um, and, and I'll wrap up shortly, I realize I'm, I'm chatting way too much here. Um, we can also see some very, uh, some differences already from the Georgia campaign, the 2018 disinformation campaign and the 2022 Ukraine campaign. Uh, obviously not least of which um, is that we're currently in a hot war, but apart from that, um, you can see that it's gone up to the highest political uh, level. It, the disinformation campaign has had an incredibly high political profile. It's gone straight to the UN Security Council. Putin himself ha has been making these allegations. Um, we've also seen a lot of um, support for the disinformation campaign by far right uh, groups, by conspiracy theorists, particularly in the US. Um, so there was this very fertile ground, this kind of echo chamber uh, that was ready to, to pick up anything uh, that came out, um, which meant that the disinformation campaign spread even that much uh, faster. Um, and I think the, the, the final very big um, difference today is that uh, China is absolutely on board with the, um, the Russian disinformation campaign, and we can talk uh, more about that um, as well. But I think despite these kind of outrageous falsehoods, and as I say, you know, uh, the evidence is surprisingly poor that's provided. It's provided in very kind of informal way. Um, we cannot dismiss them as inconsequential because these campaigns muddy the waters. They make it harder for non-experts to distinguish between true and false narratives. Uh, the disinformation could further escalate the war in Ukraine, and it could create perceptions that the taboo against biological weapons no longer holds, that disinformation somehow normalizes biological weapons. Um, and if unanswered, these false allegations can linger and they can take on malevolent lives of their own that damage um, the conventions that we have. Um, there were a few more things I wanted to say, and may I have a couple of more minutes? Uh, is that okay, Jeff? Or should I just wrap up here and kind of bring them back into the conversation later? I think maybe why don't you wrap up here? We'll have some time in Q&A, and if, if uh, the um, Q&A sort of runs out on its own, then we can kind of let everybody do sort of final thoughts. Okay. 
<laughs> All right, that sounds good. All right, well, um, I hope that's left um, people with at least some initial thoughts about um, and conversation starters. And as I say, I have a, a little bit more ammunition should we need that uh, later on. But for now, uh, thanks for your attention and I'll pass straight back over to Jeff. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, Philippa. And that's, um, uh, that's a great teaser. That's like uh, on the local news channel when they tell you um, some giant rainstorm is coming, come back in 20 minutes for the actual weather forecast. So everybody stick around so we can see what uh, Philippa has held in reserve. Um, our next speaker is going to be Philip Blake. Great, thanks very much. Uh, so, and that was really fascinating from Philippa. And one of the things I just want to flag is there's some really interesting parallels between the chemical and biological domains and some interesting differences too. And I think teasing out those might be a really interesting part of our conversation. I also am recognizing I have the least flattering lighting of everyone on the Zoom. I had to switch rooms at the last minute. And so sorry for the sort of one half of my face is lit, one half of my face is not. Um, so uh, I wanted to do a couple things. So a couple of weeks ago, I had a chance to do a Fox TV interview about this subject, about the possibility of chemical weapons being used and how we might think about that. Um, and I said at that time, and I think I'm still in that place, that I didn't expect Russia to use them, but that I wouldn't be surprised if they did. And I recognize, as I say that, that they may already have used them, right? There are these reports that have emerged out of Mariupol, and um, we, can, we can delve into those more deeply. My personal best guess is that they weren't used, but this is actually an interesting example of the way in which there's a lot of ambiguity, and that can feed into narratives and misinformation and disinformation, um, something that it, you know, is fascinating on the bio side, but in its own way, really interesting on the chemical side. So I want to do a couple things. I want to unpack potential Russian motivations for using chemical weapons. I want to talk briefly about Russian capabilities, um, and then I want to touch on consequences. I'm not going to go deeply into responses because that's in uh, Hannah's camp. And in particular, I think she'll be building on her really wonderful op-ed that she just had in the Washington Post talking about some of the dilemmas or challenges that we have in terms of imposing consequences and therefore both in deterring Russia and in responding to it. Um, so I think one of the ways in which uh, chemical weapons are different than biological weapons is that they do have more military utility. Um, it is often said that a well-prepared, well-equipped, well-trained military can function in a chemical weapon contaminated environment. And I think that's considerably exaggerated. Uh, and chemical weapons do have potentially quite significant tactical implications, which could accumulate to strategic implications on a battlefield. And they're particularly effective against less well-trained, less well-equipped forces. I don't have a nuanced sense of where Ukraine falls here, but I'm, I think probably somewhere in the middle. Uh, not as well trained and equipped as the United States, which is at the very high end of that spectrum, but better so than uh, than various countries. But I, you know, the way I like to talk to my students about this is, imagine trying to accurately fire your rifle from behind a gas mask. Like just imagine how much more challenging that is. Imagine trying to run on a battlefield and to do all the things that soldiers do inside a full body chemical protective suit. It ma has potentially massive implications for soldiers doing what soldiers need to do. So I think there's a potential tactical logic for Russia to use these weapons, and we'll flesh this out a little more. Um, and I think that's particularly true in urban environments where you have fighters who are, who are dug in, who are hard to hit directly. Um, it's a kind of a version of different, but it's a version of the trench warfare environment in World War I where chemical weapons first emerged as a kind of a logical tactical innovation to a dilemma of being able to strike people directly. Um, and chemical weapons are particularly effective against both less well-equipped, less well-trained militaries, and they're horrifically effective against civilians who don't really have the ability to protect themselves at all. Um, so I think there's a certain tactical logic which could rise to a strategic level. And what's interesting here is even relatively small amounts of chemical weapons can force troops into protective gear. Even hoaxes technically could force troops into protective gear in a way that has tactical implications and could also feed into the psychological effects and misinformation and disinformation that would affect civilians. Um, there's a kind of a psychological or terrorizing logic to chemical weapons. And I think that's a part of why we saw the Syrian regime, the Assad regime in Syria use these in the, um, the recent conflict that's now, uh, that's now coming to a close. 
um, and right, a way of both terrorizing combatants, um, but in particular terrorizing supportive populations or civilians and kind of imposing a, a cost onto, uh, onto civilians. And I think that's a reason why one could imagine Russia um, using chemical weapons in this context. Um, and again, even relatively modest amounts of chemical weapons and even potentially hoaxes could have some effect here. Um, this is a little bit counterintuitive, but I think chemical weapons, and this is something I've thought a lot about in the Syrian con context, but I think chemical weapons can be a way to send a costly signal. In international relations, we talk about cheap signals and costly signals, right? And costly signals send a stronger message in part because they're costly for you. Um, and I think chemical weapons and absorbing or, or accepting the risk that using chemical weapons entails and the sort of undercutting of the norms or even taboos that, that entails, that's a way of sending a costly signal. And so I think another reason that we might see Russia use chemical weapons is to send a message, both potentially in Ukraine, so to Ukrainian fighters and Ukraine as a whole and the Ukrainian government, that they're willing to cross certain red lines, they're willing to bear cost, they're willing to bear risk, um, and to external audiences, right? This is a form of signaling. And again, I think this is part of the logic of the Assad regime. And the thing that's really perplexing about these costly signals is that it may actually be the case that our efforts to deter heighten the effectiveness of these costly signals, right? The fact that the red line has been drawn in the sand may actually make the costly signal more effective because it's more costly, that's the point. And so that's kind of counterintuitive and I just wanna flag that. And an extreme version of this is if Russia uses chemical weapons, I think one might actually interpret that in part as a nuclear threat. I think that's a way of Russia saying, look, we are willing to cross these red lines. We are willing to bear these risks. We are willing to, to use a term that gets used in other contexts, but we are willing to escalate to deescalate. Uh, and so I think if Russia uses chemical weapons, I, I will interpret that in part as a kind of a veiled nuclear threat, as a, an implication that Russia might be willing to go all the way uh, to the nuclear level. Um, and finally, and this is something that I was uh, inspired to add to my list of possible Russian motivations by reading Hannah's excellent op-ed, I think we could imagine Russia either at a leadership level or at a lower level of command in the military using chemical weapons vindictively or punitively. And in particular, I think if the Russians perceive themselves as having been humiliated by the Ukrainians in some way, and by the way, notice how important humiliation has been in this conflict. Like look at all those memes about the Moskva, right? This Russian flagship that, of the Black Sea that sank, right? Humiliation is a central part of the kind of memes and the social dynamic and the information that's circulating around this conflict. And I think if the Russians perceive themselves as having been humiliated, lashing out with chemical weapons might be quite appealing. So that's a sort of a less rational version of a motivation that I'm concerned about as well. In terms of capabilities, obviously the Soviet Union and then Russia inherited a robust chemical weapons arsenal. And Russia completed the destruction of that arsenal about five years ago under the supervision of the OPCW. Um, and it is very hard in the public domain to get much sense of what sort of capabilities, if any, Russia retained. Obviously, Russia has used in small quantities chemical weapons in subsequent years, including interestingly in 2004 in Ukraine, albeit a dioxin, uh, an industrial chemical that appears to have been, um, that was targeted against a, a pro-Western uh, presidential candidate, Viktor Yushchenko. Um, and that, that's not what we would classically consider a chemical warfare agent, but certainly a violation of commitments under, uh, under the Chemical Weapons Convention. Um, having a limited capability to do things like that is not the same as having the ability to use chemical weapons at scale. And if Russia today has the ability to use chemical weapons at scale, that's a capability that they have been retaining or developing for many years. That's not a switch that you just flip. And there is an enormous logistical supply chain and there are a lot of nuances associated with being able to use chemical weapons at scale on the battlefield. And in the public domain, we have little to no insight about whether in fact Russia retains such a capability um, and its ability to use chemical weapons obviously hinges on, on, having, uh, on having such a capability. Um, if Russia has such a capability, one of the interesting nuances of the Syrian conflict that we've seen play out just in recent years 
is the way in which the Syrian regime improvised and built off of its existing capability with, for example, imp improvised munitions that it specifically developed for the purpose of the use in that conflict, building off of the robust chemical weapons capabilities that it already has. And it's interesting to think about how we might see that manifest in Syria. In terms of consequences, obviously the localized consequences of chemical weapons use for actors who are actually targeted with them could be quite severe, in particular because if Russia has the capability to use chemical weapons and to use them at larger scale, that capability is presumably quite sophisticated. Um, I think chemicals alone are unlikely to be decisive. I think they're unlikely to, uh, to, to, be, to tip the situation in some consequential way to have strategic impacts, unless it's very close to a tipping point anyway. Um, but they certainly could have meaningful effects and those effects could aggregate in a way, including psychological effects and others uh, that, would be, that would be quite co consequential. And then if Russia does use chemical weapons, the reputational consequences I think of that will be quite significant, notwithstanding the reputational consequences of this conflict and Russia's conduct in it so far. And in particular, I think there will be consequences for the kind of long-term rehabilitation of Russia for its long-term reintegration into the international system. I think to be such a pariah, to join the very small club of states that have engaged in such behaviors. And I think the behavior of using them at scale in Ukraine would be quite different than the behavior of using them in a targeted way in Salisbury uh, and otherwise that we've seen Russia exhibit in recent years. And so I think that reputational consequence and that implication for the long-term reintegration of Russia um, would, be, would be quite consequential. Um, and in terms of responses, as I said, I'm not gonna delve particularly into it except to say that I, if you haven't read it, I highly recommend Hannah's Washington Post op-ed from, uh, from last week, where she kind of unpacks the challenges that we, from the US perspective and the perspective of other states um, who are trying to support Ukraine, the challenges that we face both in uh, deterring Russia from this conduct and if Russia engages in this conduct of responding to it effectively. So with that, I'll wrap up uh, and I'm very much looking forward to the conversation. It's fun to see who we have among our attendees uh, so it would be a shame if we didn't get a chance to draw on their expertise and engage their questions as well. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Philip. Uh, and just a reminder for anybody um, who joined uh, after we started, um, if you have questions, use the Q&A box at the bottom to type them in. But um, I wanna get through all three of our speakers' comments first and then we'll circle back uh, to your very good questions. So uh, next up is Hannah Nota. Thank you, Jeff, and it's a great pleasure to join such a distinguished panel today. And I also wanted to say up front, it's quite an opportune, I think, time for us to be having this conversation because actually this Friday, the 29th of April, we'll celebrate the 25th anniversary of the Chemical Weapons Convention entry into force. That's actually later this week. Um, Philip, I think, has done an amazing job of outlining the various uh, mil options for military utility that the Russians could see for chemical weapons use in Ukraine, use in an urban environment, a t terrorizing um, sort of signal, vindictive use, um, sending a sort of a costly signal. So I very much agree with those. And I wanted to say upfront that in my piece in the Washington Post, I essentially argue that should Russia judge it militarily expedient to use such a weapon in Ukraine, and I, I'm not sure the answer to that has been given in Moscow yet, then we are left with very few good options for deterring such use, given the erosion of the chemical weapons taboo um, due to its use in the Syrian war, because I argue in the piece, economic sanctions on Russia, further political isolation, consequences at the OPCW, even normative considerations, probably have at this point been factored in in Moscow. And so the most um, credible deterrent against such use is the United States warning that chemical weapons use in Ukraine would be met with an in-kind response, as President Biden put it, which leaves open the option of a, of a cautious, narrow military response or an asymmetric response, such as a cyber attack, which probably Moscow calculates will be cautious since the United States is very concerned with escalation risks in the Ukraine war. But still, I think this is, this is the calculation that Moscow would have to make. 
But what I actually wanted to focus on in my remarks is to summarize briefly for you where we are today with Russia at the OPCW, given disagreements with Russia in recent years over Syrian non-compliance and over the Navalny poisoning, because the state of play at the OPCW today has significant implications for what we could see should there be chemical weapons use uh, in Ukraine. So where are we with Russia at the OPCW? So you know that there was um, relatively constructive cooperation with Russia in uh, demilitarizing Syria's declared chemical weapons in 2013 and 2014. But unfortunately, after that, we saw an erosion uh, of cooperation with the Russians at the OPCW over two separate sort of baskets of issues. The first was the question over the accuracy and completeness of Syria's initial declarations. So that became a vexing issue over time. But more importantly, uh, over the pursuit of attribution for continued chemical weapons use, which we saw from 2014, notwithstanding Syria signing up to the Chemical Weapons Convention. Now, to deal with that issue, several mechanisms were created in the OPCW. In 2014, an initial fact-finding mission, or FFM, which had the mandate to establish where the chemical weapons had been used in Syria. A year later, we get the so-called JIM, the Joint Investigative Mechanism, which was endorsed by the Security Council, and the Russians supported it, and it had the mandate to attribute responsibility for chemical weapons use. Now, once the JIM started issuing reports, and also labeled the Syrian government responsible for chemical use. The Russians vetoed that mechanism and by November 2017, the gym was no more. What the OPCW then did was try to circumvent the Russian veto and create an avenue for attribution within the OPCW. So in the summer of 2018, you have a, a special session of the Conference of States parties, whereby a majority vote and Russia was very much against that vote. Um, the technical secretariat was directed to put in place what's called the IIT, the Identification and Investigation Team, which now in the OPCW has the mandate to uh, pursue attribution for chemical use. Um, now, Russia has been arguing against these mechanisms and trying to obstruct their use for years. So regarding the fact-finding mission, the Russians early on uh, sort of took issue with the alleged opera sort of the operationalization of that mechanism, alleged violations and the chain of custody in terms of how the OPCW was collecting data by selection of eyewitnesses um, and, and sort of and, and this is where the disinformation on the chemical side very much comes in and sounds very familiar to what uh, Philippa told us about the BW side. Um, it, there was really a campaign in recent years to label this FFM as biased, as politically motivated, as unprofessional. And uh, information warfare has been extensively used by the Russians to claim that there are first of all, false flag attacks in Syria um, involving chemical use, but then also that the OPCW has been essentially hijacked in sort of pursuing an anti-Syrian agenda and, and coming up with, with false findings. Now, regarding this IIT, this novel mechanism, the Russians have actually taken th three different kinds of legal issues with that instrument, which are worth distinguishing. Uh, first of all, Russia said the fact that this was adopted at the Conference of States parties by majority vote violated the spirit of consensus that's usually sort of um, applicable to substantive decisions at the OPCW. Then Russia says that endowing the technical secretariat with the mandate for attribution actually violates the Chemical Weapons Convention. This is the prerogative of the UN Security Council. And then finally, since Russia has already discredited the FFM, the fact-finding mission, which collects data on chemical use, and the IIT bases its uh, analysis on FFM findings, Russia says, well, the IIT cannot be legitimate because it, it uses this, this flawed data. Now, I detail to you these Russian attacks on the FFM and the IIT because they give us a good indication of what will likely happen procedurally at the OPCW were we to see chemical weapons use in Ukraine. Where we are now, Syria was uh, sanctioned uh, at the OPCW about a year ago and its voting rights have been suspended. So with Syria, we're at a complete impasse with Russia at the OPCW. 
Then comes the Navalny poisoning about 18 months ago with a Novichok agent. And the disputes over that have further sort of compounded the grievances with Russia at the OPCW. So first of all, on the Navalny incident, Russia has argued that, you know, it's dismantled all its chemical weapons under OPCW monitoring. That process was concluded by 2017. No one has ever raised the question of Russian non-compliance with the Chemical Weapons Convention in the organs of the OPCW. So essentially, what are you talking about? Us having Novichok to poison someone. We, we have completed our process of destruction, unlike the United States. This is something, a, a talking point that the Russians often like to come back to, that the United States has not completed its, its destruction yet. And so Russia regarding the Navalny case essentially says, if anything, this is a matter for Article 7 of the Chemical Weapons Convention. That article refers to national implementation of the Chemical Weapons Convention inside a country. So in, in accordance with that article, Russia could conduct an investigation into the Navalny poisoning since it happened on Russian soil. But because other countries, including Germany, are withholding their analysis of the Novichok um, that was used, Russia basically says, well, we cannot proceed with the investigation. Now, there were attempts at the OPCW to try to move through that impasse. Uh, there was talks of a technical assistance mission to be dispatched to Russia. That failed because you know, the Russian side and the OPCW could not agree on the modalities for that. So um, you know, the latest uh, last fall was that uh, states parties at the OPCW moved this into a clarification procedure under Article 9. This, you know, this is all just to say that we are very much at an impasse with Russia over the question of the of the Navalny poisoning. And so I think the implications of the Syria dossier and um, the Navalny poisoning um, with Russia at the OPCW, um, they imply a number of things. First of all, an erosion of the red line over chemical weapons use due to the multiple use in Syria and a failure to restore deterrence of chemical weapons use in Syria. Russia discrediting existing mechanisms at the OPCW to investigate use. There was then a certain creativity by the OPCW to overcome that and create new mechanisms with the IIT. But unfortunately, that has led to further polarization at the OPCW with Russia. And then Russia's own alleged non-compliance with the Chemical Weapons Convention has not been tackled at the OPCW in the context of looking into the Navalny poisoning. So what are the implications of all this for the situation in Ukraine? The first thing I want to say, and, and, and here I, I very much echo what Philippa has said on the BW side, even if there's no use of chemical weapons, the disinformation that Russia has been engaging in on the CW side is damaging uh, to the regime. I mean, I'll just give you the most recent example because I think it was just two or three days ago where the head of the Russian NBC defense troop, um, a, a gentleman called uh, General Kirillov, accused the United States of preparing to engage in WMD provocation again in Ukraine chemical, tactical, nuclear, or biological. And it was a very sort of detailed um, statement outlining potential scenarios for how that, how, how that could look like. One of them actually the use of chemical weapons in Azov style in Mariupol, where um, there's still civilians and Ukrainian uh, military hiding out. And I think similar to what Philippa said on the BW side, this undermines faith in the regime because this disinformation is being picked up here and there. Uh, you know, in, even in Western uh, societies, it sows doubts, it sows confusion. I think what it does, because of the sheer um, volume and complexity of narratives that Russia sort of throws out in the, into this disinformation, at a minimum, it creates the sentiment oh, well, this is really complicated and we don't really know what happened. And of course, Russia always starts its disinformation on CWs with a reference to Colin Powell speaking at the UN Security Council in 2003, alleging WMD in Iraq, which were then nowhere to be found to sort of you know, set the stage for its claims that this is all just sort of fabricated by the United States. And one thing, and one thing I, I wanna add here is I think this constant uh, WMD disinformation is also beneficial for Russia 
in terms of signaling to its own population, because it needs to present arguments for why this quote unquote special military operation against Ukraine is necessary. And to say that there's a WMD threat emanating from Ukraine vis-a-vis -vis Russia sort of actually reinforces that claim. So this is sort of about the disinformation. So it's, it's already damaging even if we don't see use. Now, should we see chemical weapons used in Ukraine Building on what I said on Syria and Navalny, I think the OPCW will have three challenges. First of all, Russia will claim that it doesn't have any chemical weapons to begin with. And as I said, even though the US State Department in its annual reports on compliance with the CWC has argued that Russia is non-compliant with, uh, with its obligations, this dossier has never been properly opened at the OPCW. In order to do that, you would probably need to invoke a, a challenge inspection inside Russia, which is a mechanism in the CWC that has never been invoked for various reasons. Um, and then Russia will likely discredit any investigatory effort. So let's say there's use in Ukraine and a new FFM fact-finding mission is created for Ukraine. I think building on the Syria precedent, we can be quite sure that any such efforts and the way that they are operationalized will just be discredited by Russia. And actually in this statement that I was just quoting from by this Russian general, he's already signaling that this will happen. So I, I quote from this statement, the chemical incidents will be investigated by the attributive staff, that's the IIT, of the OPCW that permits to fabricate the necessary proofs and to sentence the responsibility as it can be seen fit. So already Russia is sort of saying, this is how it'll play out. It'll all be fabricated and used to put pressure on Russia, um, um, punish Russia, isolate Russia. And so um, I think this is what we will likely see. So what? So if, if things will be very difficult at the OPCW, what does that leave us with? Of course, there's the whole question regarding a possible military response that I already uh, alluded to at the beginning to chemical weapons use in Ukraine or um, economic sanctions. I mean, in terms of punitive strikes, we can go back to the Syria precedent where uh, during the Trump administration, there were actually twice airstrikes against Syria after the use of chemical weapons in April 2017 and April 2018. Though, of course, now we're dealing with a nuclear power, so the stakes are, are very different. And maybe we can come back to that in the discussion. Um, then there is the question over um, what the IIT can do. So this IIT identification and investigation team in the Syria case, for instance, has been transferring its findings to something that's called the Triple IM, the International Impartial and Independent Mechanism, which in turn facilitates court cases under the principle of universal jurisdiction in European courts to hold Syrian individuals, individual officials accountable for their complicity uh, in, in chemical weapons used in Syria. So there is this path possibly towards individual criminal accountability were we to see chemical weapons used in, in Ukraine, but that is certainly not the same as holding the state uh, accountable. Um, and then of course, building on the impasse that we're already in with, with Russia over the Navalny poisoning, things at the OPCW could gradually move towards a stage where Russia is also suspended, like Syria was a year ago. And I would submit to you that if it comes to that, Russia would likely leave the OPCW, similar to what it did with the UN Human Rights Council, I think a couple of weeks ago, because Russia, I think for status reasons, will not endure a suspension at these kinds of international bodies. Perhaps uh, I'll end there and yeah, happy to answer further questions in the Q&A and, and to discuss with the others. Great, thank you very much, uh, Hannah. Three really um, excellent presentations. Um, we'll move to Q and A in just a second, but I um, may take advantage of the fact that I'm, I'm moderator to take the moderator hat off for one second and add a few uh, comments based on my own uh, work. I've been involved in a um, long-running project with two of Philippa's uh, colleagues at uh, King's College, uh, Win Bowen and Matthew Moran, where we have uh, looked at. Uh, U.S. and to a lesser extent uh, U.K. and French responses to the Assad regime's use of chemical weapons in Syria, uh, why it was so hard to generate, generate any kind of effective deterrence against that, but also sort of the 
the um, slightly um, puzzling exception of the, the successful up to a point uh, uh, compellent pressures to sign the CWC. Um, and, and what I would say is that uh, both the options that were used and, and the alternative paths that, that uh, Wynn and Matt and I have considered uh, that could be used vis-a-vis -vis Syria, they're really not available vis-a-vis -vis Russia. So, um, you know, launching uh, cruise missile strikes or bombing of sites inside uh, Russian territory, I think, would not be on the table for the United States and, and NATO in response to a chemical strike. Nukes would be different, but I think chem and bio, uh, the caution would still prevail. Um, you know, the alternative that, that we had looked at is one that might have had at least somewhat better probability of working would have been to try to do things that uh, would have increased uh, the risk to uh, regime survival for the Assad regime and essentially try to manipulate that depending on uh, whether chemicals continue to be used or not. Uh, but trying to overthrow Putin is also not really a viable threat and probably one that would be counterproductive given that that's sort of the core of his you know, his fears. So if the United States and NATO are, are going to make an effort or, or are in the process now of making an effort to deter uh, fears of uh, chemical or biological use by Russia in Ukraine, they're going to have to find a different and I think very creative set of consequences to threaten. Um, and, and the final point I'll make, and then we'll, we'll turn to questions, is that um, uh, as we all know from, from uh, our wa many watchings of, of Dr. Strangelove, if you don't communicate the threat, uh, it can't deter. So merely saying we have concerns about chemical or biological use is not deterrence. And at some point there has to be actual messaging. It can be private and not public, but unless um, the Biden administration and US allies are willing to say things like, look, if you use chemical or biological weapons, this is the set of things that we will do in response. And those are things that are sufficiently disliked by Russia to make them think twice. You know, right now, as far as I can tell, we don't, we know, we, we may be setting up for a deterrence failure, uh, but, but potentially it's because of a failure to deter in the first place. As I said, there may be things going on in private uh, that I'm not seeing, but I certainly haven't seen good clear, explicit uh, deterrent messages uh, in public. Um, so let's let's turn to questions. I mean, these were three super rich, super informative and thought provoking presentations. Um, uh, Masako uh, Toki of the CNS staff has, uh, has been hiding in the background uh, as the host of this meeting, but um, we use the chat. And I think because we have a relatively small set of attendees and a lot of friends, including some former uh, US government officials, um, we're going to let people, she's going to temporarily promote people to panelist status and we'll let everybody ask your questions out loud instead of me uh, reading them. So the first question that came in came from Min Lee. So uh, Min, if you're still there and you'd like to ask your question, Masako can uh, give you the chance to unmute and, and turn on your camera if you want. Oh, we're, we're still not hearing you for some reason. Is that better? Yes, we've got you. Perfect, thank you. Uh, first, I want to thank the panelists for such a really informative uh, session. I guess my my question goes back to the whole, um, you know, uh, norms that it's been like heavily discussed in, in the conversation. Um, especially um, with Philip's point towards how Russia can actually leverage the the, the norms, you know, against use, using these these weapons for um, you know to send a message. I guess my question is is um, how how effective will will you know the norm continue to be uh, in terms of you know the Russian not leveraging it in in, in that case how. If, uh, effective the norms will continue to be to sort of discourage, uh, you know, Russia considering these these um, weapons. I guess it could really be for all three panelists. Um, I don't know, Philippa, do you want to try to take first swing at it? Sure. Um, well, hi, Min. It's great to see you. Um, thanks for your question. In terms of the social norms, uh, on their own, I don't think the social norms would deter Russia from using biological weapons. Um, I do think um, the legal norms 
um, have some effect uh, on their own, I don't think they would uh, deter Russia either. From my perspective, it's really about military utility and what they would get out of using these weapons. And I don't think they would get much out of using these, the biological weapons. And so from my perspective, um, it's more about military utility than it is um, about the, the norm. Uh, it might be slightly different on the, the, the chemical side, so, so um, others may want to, to answer uh, as well. I mean, I'll just quickly say, and perhaps Philip disagrees with me here, but I would unfortunately say that the social and legal norms on the CW side are also at this stage insufficient deterrence should Russia use consider the use of chemical weapons again militarily expedient which is uh, a question i wouldn't conclusively answer with yes the fact that Ru the russian government has over years shielded the syrian government uh, at the opcw and un security council even though there's no evidence i believe to suggest that russia has been directly responsible for chemical weapons use in syria itself that's i believe not the case but it has shielded the syrian government would suggest that you know the, the social norm against chemical weapons use in conflict is not considered that um, that relevant on on the Russian side. And then regarding the resonance of the legal norm, as I was just sort of trying to argue in my remarks, the consequences that Russia would have to face at the OPCW, you know, so at a maximum, it's likely a suspension from the OPCW, which I don't think is a, is a sufficient deterrent for Russia. Um, at this point, the avenue to the UN Security Council would be blocked through a Russian and, and possibly Chinese veto, so we wouldn't see consequences there. There's the issue of criminal uh, accountability for individuals, but the, you know, the extent to which that is a, a sufficient deterrent on the Russian side, I also um, very much doubt. So I don't, I don't think that the social and legal norms by themselves are, are sufficient here. Great, thank you. So I've got um, three people uh, in the line. I'll just sort of let everybody know the, the order. Um, Rose Gaudemuller uh, will be next, uh, then Bill Potter, and then uh, Vasily Tuganov. Uh, so uh, Masako, if you can allow Rose to speak, she's next. Okay, hi, can you all see me? Uh, we can hear you fine, Rose. Um, we don't see you, your ah, vision. Then I need to start my video. There you okay, go. Okay, you're there with I us. Am. All right. Thank you very much. Fascinating presentations. Thank you so much. Very, very thoughtful. Um, and congratulations, Hannah, on your great piece in the Washington Post. That was really very thought provoking. I have a general question for all three of you, uh, but I do want uh, I ask a question in the chat, Philippa, specifically to you, if, if you might. Uh, answer them. Hannah, I was really taken by your remark uh, right at the end of your presentation that you think if this kind of pressure keeps up uh, in, the C in the OPCW, that Russia will simply flee uh, the OPCW and the CWC. This policy that was undertaken by the United States, uh, really the, the campaign was led by the United States and our very capable ambassador at the OPCW, Ken Ward, to get the OPCW to vote which is entirely allowed by uh, the arrangements and the charter of the OPCW, but it had never been used before. So I find it hilarious that the Russians refer to this kind of tradition of consensus, which of course had existed before, but they succeeded in undermining by their behavior with regard to Syria. So the USG, I'd already left the government at that point and was at NATO, but the USG undertook this effort to bolster uh, the OPCW's authority and to bolster the norm uh, inherent in the CWC by this action to bring the Syrians to account in this way at the OPCW. So far, the Russians have fought it there, um, but I'm um, interested in your notion. I'd like everybody to count uh, to also perhaps weigh in with your view. Will the Russians under pressure start fleeing these international regimes now, uh, essentially uh, voting with their feet as they've been speaking about, you know, we're going to have our own rules. We're not going to abide by these international norms and rules anymore. So will they start voting with their feet and uh, abandoning uh, these international uh, 
institutions as they are in the midst of, you know, transforming themselves into a pariah state overall. I'd be interested in, in everybody's view on that question. Thank you. Philippa, do you want to go first with the question posed to you by Rose in the chat, and then I'll <clears throat> come back to the CW one? And part of that question, Philip, is that uh, Ken Ward is going to be our ambassador to the BWC RevCon, and I think he will do his best to use the RevCon as an effective, al along with the support of the USG and we hope the international community to, to bolster the norm in the in the BWC RevCon, but I'm interested in how, how you think that's going to go, if that's going to be uh, working or not. Yeah, it's it's great to have Ken as the kind of supporting the U.S. delegation, actually. Um, and he we already got a preview at the uh, PrepCom just uh, a couple of weeks back. Um, and uh, he was great uh, and, and made a lot of really, uh, I think, uh, poignant uh, points. So th that was terrific. Uh, but you ask about the RevCon, the elusive RevCon, which we've been waiting on. Uh, throughout the pandemic, it's been rescheduled a number of times. We finally had a date and then the NPT was set and now we've shifted ours yet again. But hopefully it will go ahead at the end of the year. I think the signals, your question is about whether the, we could use the RevCon to counter the disinformation campaign. Um, I think we already got um, a good sense of that at the PrepCom. Um, there were a lot of states pushing back strongly on uh, the disinformation narrative that was coming out of Russia. Unfortunately, that was all Western states. It was very clear in the room that there was a division. Again, it's as polarized as it's always been in the BWC. And now that we have a closer relationship between China and Russia, I know generally, but also very specifically on the bio side, we've seen uh, over the last half a year, uh, statements by the foreign ministers, statements by, uh, you know, both uh, Putin and Xi Jinping together at their, uh, you know, in, in advance of the, the, the winter Olympics, uh, talking about this new era, um, again, raising these concerns about U.S. overseas bioweapons activities, et cetera, this closer relationship between China and Russia, I think, um, make it even harder to get other states on board with Western views. Um, and so this polarization uh, continues. I don't actually think it's fruitful to... Um, I mean, we, ha we can't let the disinformation go unchallenged, but I don't think we should be um, rebutting every point that is put to us. I don't think that's how uh, is an effective way of addressing the disinformation. Uh, I think it's important to say this is disinformation. And if you want information, this is what we're doing. We're open. You can find out what we're funding, the sorts of research we're doing, et cetera, et cetera. I think what is more important is uh, education generally to um to 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 um develop a more educated citizenry that's capable of critical thinking right and that knows where the uh, legitimate information is and i think that's a general way of dealing with false stories and rumors so i think we need to do a lot more generally in that space when it comes to disinformation i think when we're talking about national security issues um that sort of education will involve giving away more uh by the state so it'll involve giving away more secrets what are the threats by extension revealing some of the level of knowledge about how such knowledge was obtained um, it will, um, you know, involve more giving away of the strategies for dealing with those threats, uh, and by extension, what the current limitations in government policies are. Um, all of these sorts of things, um, giving away more information more broadly, you know, is anathema to intelligence agencies. So I think we have a very difficult balancing uh, act there about educating about this um, and giving away some of these um, more closely guarded 
state statecraft essentially and so um i uh you know I, and i think until this happens more routinely by many countries um we will keep having more of these battles of influence more of this disinformation uh, going around i do think the extreme intelligence sharing that we've sort of seen in ukraine has been one way of trying to to in to um, educate in this space um and i'd be very interested to hear um what you rose think about that and how that's gone uh, on reflection but also what uh others in in the room think about this more extreme intelligence um information sharing uh strategy um in order to counter some of that disinformation um how how effective that's been thank you so much uh, Philip or Hannah, did you also want to respond to, to Rose's question? I'll, I'll briefly respond to the yeah, thank you, Rose, for the question. Um, look, I don't think we're yet at a point where Russia will leave the OPCW. I do believe that Russia would not endure a suspension. And we now, now are in a place with Russia over the Navalny issue where the Article 9, I think Paragraph 2 clarification procedure has been activated in the fall. And since Russia is not responding in any constructive way, the next logical state would be to move this to what's called the paragraph three to seven uh, clarification procedure, which is a multi-stage procedure, which would logically end up with a special session of the conference, being able to recommend any measures that it, it, it deems necessary to resolve the situation. So my point is we're now sort of on a slippery slope where if Western countries also want to remain credible at the OPCW, we could end up with a suspension of Russia at the OPCW. And of course, if, if Russia were to use chemical weapons in Ukraine, then that would further sort of aggravate the situation. And, and I don't think that Russia would endure such a suspension. I mean, it's been my hunch until now that Russia still values being part of these multilateral organizations, um, sees them as you know um, linked to its, its status as a permanent member of the UN Security Council. But then, you know, there's also been this discourse, and that's not a new discourse in recent years, where Russian intellectuals have sort of mocked these post-World War II or post-Cold War institutions as indicative of, of a rules-based international order, which Russia uses in a sort of mocking way as institutions that are just sort of privatized by the United States and its allies to pursue their own interests. There are individuals, uh, you know, like a Sergei Karaganov, but also a Fyodor Lukyanov who have repeatedly written about the fact that some of these institutions no longer serve Russia's interests, that the future of multilateral cooperation is best pursued through selective alliances rather than in these sort of uh, institutions that are reflective of an era in international politics that is no more. Um, so I'm sort of sitting on the fence where all this is moving going forward. I mean, at the OPCW, the Russians have been reasonably uh, successful in trying to get uh, non-aligned movement countries to at least abstain on important votes. So Russia has not been so isolated at the OPCW so far. But of course, if, if the picture there deteriorates from Moscow's point of view, then, you know, this, this sentiment against these kinds of institutions could harden. And certainly now with the kind of confrontation that the West finds itself in with Russia, I think that that might be a possibility going forward. Can I make a 30 second comment? And then I know we're tight on time. Um, and this is really generic, but the past success of these institutions has hinged on identifying areas of shared interest, even as there were huge areas where we diverged. And so I think that if there's a path back into this, that's it, right? Is there some way down the road, probably not in the near term, where there are genuine shared interests between Russia and the United States and other parties? And right now that list is pretty short, but one can at least imagine circumstances where there were in fact shared interests, even as there were massive differences. And I think that's probably, if one were trying to put an optimistic spin on this, which is hard in the short term, that's what one would look for. Great, thank you. Uh, Bill Potter, you've got the next question. Uh, <clears throat> thanks a lot, uh, Jeff. And let me echo your kind of praise of all of the uh, presentations, which I thought were superb. I'm also tempted to enter into this discussion of that, that Philip has just kind of highlighted in terms of shared interest, but I, I'll avoid that. And instead, I, I want to um, kind of observe 
that I think all of the presentations uh, were focused on the impact uh, and of the disinformation campaign on external audiences. And I want to kind of contrast that um, with what one of my uh, uh, RAs, a graduate student, uh, Matt Goldenberg, has kind of found with respect to uh, disinformation a disinformation campaign related to uh, charges having to do with Ukrainian pursuit of radiological weapons as well as nuclear weapons, which appear uh, to be directed almost entirely uh, toward a domestic audience. Uh, they're published mainly in Russian, and you can see a change in the course of the uh, propaganda narrative uh, kind of based upon developments on the ground. And so my question, and this probably is, is directed most at Hana because of her kind of Russian uh, orientation, but others are, are welcome to also kind of comment. And that's the, the extent to which in the CBW realm, uh, the disinformation that one sees uh, directed to international bodies, uh, does it do you see anything comparable uh, with respect to uh, uh, things published in Russian for a domestic audience? Yeah, thanks, Bill. I think the CW disinformation is perhaps not primarily directed at a Russian domestic audience, but it certainly is present, I think, in the Russian domestic discourse in the same way that these allegations about Ukraine developing radiological, nuclear, and, and bioweapons has been. So I think it's been really part of the mix of sustaining this, uh, this narrative from the beginning that there's a need for the special military operation in Ukraine, quote unquote, not just in order to denazify uh, Ukraine, but also because there's threats with weapons of mass destruction emanating from Ukraine. So I think the, 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 the CW piece of the puzzle has been present in the, in the Russian uh, domestic discourse. Um, but um, I, you know, it's also relatively, I think, cost-free and doesn't require a whole lot of effort on the Russian side to direct it at multiple audiences once you know the the disinformation machine is in motion and you know since the the types of narratives and the types of propaganda that is put out on quote unquote false flag like CW attacks was really honed over years uh, regarding Syria I think it was very clear sort of what we would see on the CW side sort of coming to Ukraine. So there wasn't sort of a, a need to reinvent the, the wheel, but, but yes, certainly I do see it also in the, in the Russian speaking sort of domestic context. I, I would also just jump in here to, to confirm that, you know, um, on the bio disinformation side, we've seen um, both in this particular instance, but also in the 2018 uh, campaign target at the Luger Lab in, in Ukraine, that the, the, the disinformation serves many purposes. One of most certainly is a domestic purpose as well, um, to sort of, you know, demonize the West, uh, encourage um, military spending, justifying Russian aggression or buildup of, you know, military, et cetera. So I, I do think the um, Domestic audience bill is something that we often forget to reference, but I think it's a, a, a very clear motivating factor in, in some of these campaigns. Um, and as I say, you know, they're they are sort of layered so that there are different motivations um, that are all present um, for developing the campaigns. Thanks. All right, we have um, one other person lined up to uh, ask a question, and then I think maybe after that we'll uh, give each of the speakers, uh, you know, a minute or two for any closing thoughts. Uh, so, um, Masako, if you could allow uh, Vasily um, in to ask his question. So, if you're there, Vasily, go ahead and yeah. And all right, jo joined. Okay. Uh, thank you all first foremost for your presentations. Uh, I had more, more or less similar, similar question to uh, what Dr. Potter had, had asked, but uh, I, would, I think I will jump into uh, disinformation campaign being not as uh, domestically oriented, but also probably internationally uh, oriented, because uh, for me, as I can see that, uh, I, and I wrote it in my question, uh, those uh, disinformation camp campaigns, like they're re-emitting at the UNSG form, uh, one of the UN, UNSG formats, um, as well as the um, uh, BioLab uh, 
uh, conspiracy uh, that there was a U.S. led by lab there in Ukraine, uh, and also the uh, uh, the allegations that uh, General Kir- Kirillov has also put up uh, were sort of following the narrative of uh, international concerns around events like Bucha massacre investigation and then uh, Moscow. Uh, M- Moskva anti-ship uh, cruiser uh, sinking, and also the uh, the horrific, horrific horrible uh, Mariupol siege. So basically, I I see that kind of thing going on. Uh, I I think that I'm I'm more optimist on this side. But I would like to ask, like more precisely here, do you do you do you see that as sort of the follow-ups to all that uh, bad events, to all that fa- military operation fa- failures? Uh, uh, of Russia and Ukraine, uh, those disinformation campaigns kind of following up and trying to take over the narrative in the world and also international perspective as well. Not all, not only domestic, because domestic is kind of, you know, it's kind of very inside Russia thing, uh, and about not really about just consolidation and justification of the campaign, and uh, or is it just proving grounds, you know, for everybody to uh, for uh, for Russian government to see how. Uh, the world would re- actually react on the possible use of WMD. Thank you. So that could be for all three of you, but maybe Hannah, do you want to uh, go first? Yeah, I'll just come in first. I mean, thank you for the question, uh, Vasily. I don't disagree with the notion that any kind of discourse or disinformation that is convenient to distract international attention from the Bucha massacre, for instance, is convenient for the Russian side. But I would just sort of point you to the fact that, in fact, I think we saw the allegations regarding CBWs really early on in the war preceding the sinking of the Moskva, preceding the Bucha massacre. I think the Russians and Ukrainians first addressed the issue and their concerns over CW, I think, very early on within the initial days of, of, of Russia's in, in invasion of Ukraine. So, you know, maybe something like the Kirill statement has sort of um, sort of drawn renewed attention to it. And I do think there was a certain blip in sort of narrative on CBW for, for some time, but we did see very much in the in the beginning days and weeks of the, of the invasion. So therefore, I don't think it can be merely a response to these to these military failures. I would absolutely. Thanks. Thanks, Jeff. Yes, I would absolutely uh, uh, agree with that. Um, Hannah, I I think I view the disinformation not as a kind of, oh, there's an event. Let's make up something and distract from it. Um, I think the disinformation, as I was trying to um, explain in my initial comments, it has this incredibly long history. And it's kind of this tap that you then can turn on um, more if you need to distract attention, right? So again, one motivation is definitely this kind of, well, what about it? You know, the what about is the kind of, um, don't, you know, if, if Russia is under increased scrutiny for the Novichok attacks, oh, but what about the US? They're developing biological weapons over here, you know? So there's definitely that kind of motivation. And it's not that it's um, come up with uh, from scratch, it's, it's kind of been there for a long time. They just open the tap more, right? Like they just add more stuff to it. Um, so it's, it's, and I think that's similar to what we're seeing uh, in, in in Ukraine and the disinformation campaign there. Uh, you know, the whole campaign was, it, it was, it was kind of there, but then it was to some extent sparked by a conspiracy theorist in the United States, you know, that said, oh, look, they're mapping um, the bombing in, Ukraine is being, you can map it to all of their biological labs, right? And that spread like wildfire. And so the campaign was sort of boosted by this um, unexpected uh, source. And so um, there is uh, some randomness to this. And I think there are different um, motivations as well. We talked, you know, in terms of Bill's question, there's certainly a domestic audience. There's also this external, um, more international audience. There are different motivations. There are different um, different ways in which it plays out. But but certainly, yes, this what about is an element and it is certainly there. So thanks for, for reminding us of that. 
Yeah, so I'm in raging agreement with everything that's been said, but the one other, other thing I just wanna say, and this is quite consistent with what others have said is, I think it's a mistake to focus too much on particular episodes of disinformation. And I think the broader narrative arc is really important, right? There's a story that's being told here about Russia's relationship to the West and Russia's position in the world. And these little episodes are part of that big story. And I think that, right, there's this way in which these, like the micro, like a particular episode of CW disinformation is interesting. And then there's this bigger story that's being told that's really resonating. And it's, I still have a couple Facebook friends in Russia. I don't know how they're bypassing the Russian version of the, the Great Firewall, but they are. And it's just fascinating to see how that story is playing and troubling, deeply troubling. So anyway, let me stop there. And I know we want to leave time for brief closing statements from each of us. Yeah, so I mean, the, the one other thing I might add on this question is that I know early in the conflict, there was a lot of at least media commentary that perhaps some of these allegations were also preparations for false flag operations so that if Russia were to use chem or, or less likely bio in Ukraine, um, they could immediately muddy the waters by saying no, that was a you know release by the Ukrainians. It's interesting that that has sort of um, become less prominent in the conversation as time has gone on. Well, I think we have time for probably 30 seconds each by each panelist. So maybe I'll have you guys go in reverse order of, of how you spoke. So Hanna, then Philip, then, then Philip, if you have anything else you wanted to say, really 30 seconds so that we can finish at the top I'm of the hour. 30 seconds and I have the Berlin evening sun in my face, so I'll try to be really short. Well, I'd probably just say that, you know, Next year, the United States will probably conclude its CW disarmament and we have a new review conference of the CWC. And so the next phase for the OPCW will be less about disarmament, chemical disarmament, but about non-proliferation threat reduction and investigating alleged use. And I think the organization has its work cut out for itself because it is so polarized, as I was sort of trying to explain uh, there are new challenges like low level use for assassination, which is not something that the Chemical Weapons Convention was negotiated to deal with. It was used, it was negotiated to, to deal with use in armed conflict. And then, of course, this vexing issue of, of disinformation that, that we talked about at length. So I think, yeah, it has its work cut out. Um, and I very much hope that Russia will, will remain part of the organization that we can come back to more constructive ways with Russia. Good, thank you, uh, Philip. So um, troublingly, I think we're getting a glimpse of the future of chemical and biological weapons threats. And I say that in at least two, uh, two senses. Uh, one, I think chemical and biological weapons are particularly suited to various forms of asymmetric conflict. And this is obviously also a more symmetric conflict, but it has aspects of asymmetry. And two, this relationship between chemical and biological weapons and both disinformation and misinformation. So I think this is maybe a kind of a glimpse into a dystopian future where these both play a larger role in international politics, but a different kind of role than certainly they played at the very beginning of the chemical and biological warfare age um, and, and perhaps over the intervening decades. Okay, okay Philippa. Well, actually my point segs really nicely into what Philip was saying, because I this different role of these unconventional weapons is what I wanted to talk about at, at my, in my last point that I didn't get to in my initially, which was about, well, how do we conceive of biological weapons? We thought about them in one way in the 20th century. In the 21st century, many of us in the field are studying how advances in science and technology are enabling more powerful weapons, more difficult to attribute, um, more targeted quest, um, weapons, et cetera, et cetera. I think what we're seeing in Ukraine is we're getting this reminder about the efficiency of low tech. We, you know, we're we're seeing the role of tanks. We're seeing, you know, um, the role of of siege warfare. We're looking at metal darts. Uh, I've just heard about this term, flechettes. Um, that you know, I, extraordinarily low tech kind of stuff. And I think it's this reminder, uh, reality check to many of us about well. Let's not just look at high-tech, sophisticated uh, weaponry. We also need to look at low-tech uh, weaponry. So on the biofield, that might even mean, you know, poisoning wells with corpses, catapulting dead people into cities to spread infection, um, all these sorts of giving blank smallpox blankets to, you know, um, uh, Indians, the sort of Native Americans, the sort of thing that was done ages and ages ago and, and that we completely write off today. But I do think 
and, you know, I, I say that a little bit in jest, but, you know, I do think there is a role for looking at this more low tech um, weaponry as well that we need to um, also focus on. So I hope that wasn't too long. Uh, thank you so much for the conversation. It's been terrific. Um, and I enjoyed it very much. Great. Well, oh, thank, you so, <laughs> thank you so much. And I, I don't often get to say this at a CNS seminar, but I guess we got positively medieval uh, here at the end. Um, uh, I know it's sort of challenging in the webinar format, but um, at least uh, mentally, let's um, uh, give all of our panelists a, a round of applause. This was a, a great uh, webinar that, that was both immensely uh, informative and also I think raised at least as many good questions as it answered. So thank you very much, you guys. <laughs>